We're going to start in John chapter 1, and today I'm calling this message just following Jesus. Following Jesus. And so we're going to begin today with a video clip from the series, The Chosen, and it depicts uh, what it might have been like when Jesus invited James and John, Peter and Andrew uh, to follow him. So take a look at this. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word. My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. You as well. Yes, you, James and John. Come, follow me. I'll take the fish into market and settle up Simon's death. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, now. I love that, and that's what we're going to talk about today. What, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And if you're taking notes, 
this is the first thing I want to share with you from John chapter 1, is that following Jesus is a come-as-you-are invitation. When we follow Jesus, it's a come-as-you-are invitation. Now, when I, when I was a teenager, I grew up in a, a smaller church south of here, First Assembly of God of Columbus, Indiana, and we didn't have a full-time youth pastor. And so our youth group, most years, was led by volunteers. And let me just pause for a moment and say that you don't have to be a professional minister to make an impact on people's lives. Because many, all of them made an impact on my life. As a matter of fact, I'll never forget one particular Wednesday night in a youth service. Uh, the sermon was really all, he, he's, he divvied out all of the scriptures in the Gospels where Jesus simply said, follow me. And by the way, there are 22 of them. So one by one we read, follow me. Matthew, follow me. Luke, follow me. Mark, follow me. John, follow me. I never forgot that moment because the invitation to follow Jesus, it's simple, come as you are. Now here in John chapter 1, Jesus invites Peter and Andrew and James and John and Philip and Nathaniel. In verse 43, it says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee and finding Philip, he said to him, would you say these two words, follow me. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus gave no conditions or prerequisites. He doesn't say, follow me, but first take a class. Follow me, but first I got to give some money. Follow me, but first you've got to recite this religious creed or go change your clothes before you come follow me. I want you to notice it's simple. Follow me. That's the invitation of Jesus. And I love this here in John chapter 1 because all of the people that he called to follow him were all from different backgrounds. Matthew was rich, but he was hated by people. Peter and Andrew were fishermen and probably barely able to make ends meet. John and James, on the other hand, were sons of a wealthy businessman, Zebedee. Simon the Zealot was a political activist and part mercenary with a military background. You didn't want to mess with Simon. Nathaniel was cynical and sarcastic and prejudiced. How do I know that? Verse 46, he said, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And we're going to find out in next week's story, the woman at the well, that they were all a bit racist towards Samaritans. Peter was the only one who was married. The rest of them were single. Thomas was a skeptic. But I want you to know that not one of them was a religiously perfect person. They were all common people, just like you and me. And Jesus invited them simply, follow me. And please notice, too, that all of them were at different stages in their understanding of who Jesus was at that point in their life. Some were fully convinced that he was the Messiah. Others were not fully convinced yet. Can I go ahead and tell you that you don't have to be fully convinced before you start following Jesus? You can follow him even if you're curious. You can follow him without knowing all the details that are ahead of you. I'm trying to encourage some people here today. Maybe you haven't been to church ever in your life. Maybe you're watching online and you just kind of stumbled across this. I can tell you that you can follow Jesus beginning right where you are right now with no conditions. Come on, somebody. Now, I think we do need to have a biblical definition of what it means to follow, right? In our culture, 21st century, the word follow has a lot of meanings. I can follow directions. My wife says sometimes, <laughs> right? I follow my team, the Cincinnati Reds, who are currently in first place, by the way. You're hindering the spirit of God when you react that way. I just wish you to know. No. So I follow them where online. I follow them on their website. I read about them, right? That's how I follow them, right? I can follow somebody on social media and not even know them. And they don't even know me, right? But when Jesus invited these guys to follow them, he wasn't saying, let's keep in touch. He's saying, come live with me right now. Live as I live. Learn from me. Learn a way of life. But I want you to know that he required no prerequisite, which means regardless of how you grew up, regardless of how you've lived your life, regardless of how much money you have or you don't have, and regardless of the terrible sins that you've committed, 
Jesus invites you to follow him. It doesn't matter if you've taken drugs. It doesn't matter if you're addicted to drugs right now. If you've slept with hundreds of people or even if you've killed somebody, Jesus invites you to follow him right where you are. It is a come-as-you-are invitation. And see, the problem is, recently I read about a, a survey of American Christians. What does it mean to be a Christian? And over 80% of them listed religious activity like going to church or being nice to poor people or they, they started listing activities and which may be the result of following Jesus, right? See, I think too often the problem is we think that we have to change before we follow Jesus when in reality following Jesus changes you. And we get it mixed up. I've got to get my act together before I can follow Jesus. I've got to get my, 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 my life together. No, 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 no. He says, come as you are. Follow me, and I'll change you. We see it here in John chapter 1, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John, speaking about John the Baptist, had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, means, which when it is translated means Peter. So right out of the gate, Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter. Because I think he's right out of the gate trying to illustrate to us that when we began to follow Jesus, he begins to change who we are. I want you to lean into this one because this is really powerful. The word Simon means God has heard, but the word Peter in Greek is Petros, which means rock or moving rock, which I think means that Peter was the first rolling stone. You get what you pay for. That's all I got to say. <laughs> now, this isn't the first time this happened in the Bible. Remember, in the Old Testament, God changed Abram's name to Abraham. He changed Sarai's name to Sarah. He changed Jacob's name, which meant uh, supplanter or deceiver, to Israel, right? And then he, in, even in the New Testament, he changes Saul, who killed Christians. He changes his name to Paul, which we now as the apostle Paul, when he encountered Jesus. Now, I want you to notice, too, that this transformation in Peter's life from Simon to Peter, this change wasn't instantaneous by any means. As a matter of fact, if you read the Gospels, you're going to see a lot of this in Peter's life. He had a lot of ups, and he had a lot of downs. And so, uh, but Peter is changing all along the way, nonetheless, day by day, month by month, year by year. And I want you to notice when Jesus says, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be. You're not yet, but you will be this guy. This is who you've been. This is who you're becoming. Oh, you got to get this one. Jesus begins to call out of Simon right out of the gate. Hey, who you were is not who you're going to be. Now you're going to be this. And he wasn't that instantaneously, was he? But he was becoming that because of Jesus. When we follow Jesus, he begins to change us from the inside out. I was this, and now I'm this. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was a slave, but now I'm a son. I was bound, but now I'm free. Come on, somebody. That's what it means when we follow Jesus. He changes me. So I think the question then becomes, how does that happen? How does Jesus change us? How does he transform us? Well, the answer is simpler than you might think. Because the most effective way for you to change is by engaging regularly with the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible is how God changes your life. When I read it, when I study it, 
when I memorize it, when I think about it, when I pray about it, and obviously when I apply it, it begins to change me. Now, there's some research that, that bears this up. Recently, I've, I've learned of a project called the Bible Engagement Project. And it's addressing the whole idea that we have a crisis of biblical literacy in our country. We just don't know the Bible. We own Bibles. We just don't read them. And we don't engage with it. But the research shows that when we engage with the scriptures on a regular basis, we have more love, more joy, more peace, more goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, more self-control in our lives. Does anybody recognize that list? That's called the fruit of the Spirit. And watch this. The research says that the life of somebody who engages with Scripture four or more times a week looks radically different from the life of somebody who doesn't. Now, I don't know what the magic thing about four days a week versus three, but if you engage with uh, the, the Bible at least four times a week, uh, st statistically, our lives begin to change from unbelievers. He here's some of the numbers. If I engage with the Bible four days per week, I'm 228% more likely to share my faith. 238% more likely to, to be involved in discipling other people. 59% less likely to view pornography. 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness. 57% less likely of getting drunk. 68% less likely to have sex outside of marriage. 74% less likely to participate in gambling. So the research shows us that when I engage with God's word, it changes me. It changes my attitude. It changes my want to from the inside out. Do you see this? So what is it that makes the Bible so powerful? Well, it's because this is not a book at all. It's not just ink on a page. It's not just letters on your screen or an app on your phone. This is a living thing. This is a living word. It's alive. And the Bible says this is why in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And this is powerful. The word was God. This word is God. This Bible is God and contains the word of God. Now, it's a living word. Now, the disciples didn't have a Bible like you and I have now. Now, they had the Old Testament, but they didn't have the New Testament. But how many know they still had the Word of God? Because they had Jesus. Now, if you don't get anything I'm saying today, would you get this? That Jesus and the Word of God are the same. It's so simple, but so powerful. Jesus and the Word of God are one and the same. And in Jesus, the word of God is manifested in human form, which means that the same power that Jesus had is the same power the word of God has. Let, let me put, show you another verse in verse 14 of John chapter 1. The word, talk, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. His name is Jesus. The word of God there is talking about Jesus. And I know for some of you, your experience with the Bible has been, hey, it's kind of boring, and it's been unexciting up to this point in your life. Perhaps that's because you're approaching this Bible in the, in, not in the right way. You're approaching this Bible as a religious duty, or somehow this is information, when you need to approach this Bible as a person. There's a person in here. His name is Jesus. He is the Word of God. And when I read the Bible... When I study the Bible, I'm actually doing exactly what Peter, James, and John, and Andrew did. I'm hanging out with Jesus. And, and I love this. Hanging out with the Word of God has the same effect as hanging out with Jesus. It's so good. Now, this is why a very important part of this six-week campaign is the daily Bible engagement. During these 40 days, we're all, I'm asking you all, I'm inviting you to join me, let's read through the book of John every day uh, for 40 days. But I want, I want to encourage you when you do that, do more than just read it. Read it and reread it. 
Read it and think about it. Read it and talk about it. Read it and pray it back to God. We'll show you how to do that over these next few weeks. And, and let me add one more thing. It become, the Word of God becomes even more powerful and more effective in your life when you discuss it with other people. And that's one of the reasons we're doing groups as part of this six-week process, too, because I can read it and, and study it, and it, and it does, has power. But when I begin to engage it with other people, it takes on even more power in my life. And, and again, I just want to encourage everybody to be part of a group because that's how we change. Here's the last part of, of the John chapter 1. When I follow Jesus, it's a journey of next steps. Following Jesus is not a one-time event. It's not a card that I fill out and check a box. It's not a magic prayer that I pray. It's a journey. Now, it can begin with a decision. It begins with a prayer. It begins with me deciding I'm going to follow Jesus. But how many know it's just the beginning? It's not the end. Again, I think far too many people approach being a Christian. Well, I went to church. I said the prayer. I'm in like Flynn. You don't get it at all. It's the beginning of a real relationship with the Word of God, with Jesus Christ. So it's a journey. Some of you uh, have been on this journey for years. Some of you have been on this journey for a few months. Some of you have been on this journey for a few days. Some of you are not yet decided if you're going to be on this journey yet, and that's okay. But the idea I want you to get is that when we follow Jesus, it's a journey, and all across, all, all in the rest of your life, you're going to be taking steps to follow Jesus. Here it is. Let me give you a couple examples in John 1.35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. Now, you can't ask for a more simple invitation than that. Come and see. Come and see. And so the disciple named Philip received the same invitation. Uh, verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked, come and see. The first invitation to follow Jesus was not necessarily easy, but it was simple. Come and see. It didn't come with a list of rules or a list of requirements. And I think in modern day language, we might say, come hang out with me. Let's talk. Let's learn. Now, by the way, I think this is how our church should be. I think this should be a place where people can come and see. Let's come and explore Jesus. Let's come and talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Are you getting it? You don't have, what I'm trying to say is you don't have to be perfect to come to Grace Assembly of God. That's why we call it grace. You need grace. We all need grace, right? And we want to be the kind of place... You don't have all your stuff worked out, but let's come and see. And when we invite people to church, hey, just come and see what God is doing. This is also what we want in our small groups, right? Because some people, for the life of them, they think if they walk into a church building, the whole thing's going to fall down. And they, they would go to a group at your house with coffee, right, and talk, hey, come and see. Some of you should probably think about leading a group in these next 40 days at your work, or uh, at school and say, hey, how would you like? we're doing the, studying the book of John for the next 40 days. Would you like to join with me and, and do this? Come and see. Just come check it out. Now, the invitation to follow Jesus started with come and see, but it didn't stop there. All along the way, Jesus kept inviting them to take steps to become more like him. And over the course of the next three and a half years, Jesus required more and more of his disciples. And over time, he began to turn up the heat and the definition of what it meant to follow him. In John chapter 8, he says, if you follow me, you're my disciple, 
You've got to obey my word. In John 13, he said, this is how people are going to know that you follow me. You actually love each other. In John 15, he says, if you follow me, you're going to bear much fruit. Now, did this happen to all those disciples right at the beginning? No. But as they began to follow him, he began to change them, and he began to help them understand what it meant to truly follow him. I want, I, want, I want you to take two things away from this. First of all is that spiritual growth does not happen instantaneously. It, it doesn't happen just like that. It's a journey that is a, a journey of next steps. And then the second thing is that spiritual growth doesn't happen accidentally. You actually have to keep taking steps to follow Jesus. Does that make sense, everybody? I think... I think far too many of us, we think, well, following Jesus, I checked the box, I prayed the prayer. No, 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 now, now I'm following Jesus. Have you ever played follow the leader? Right? The person in front of you is, you know, doing something. Your, your job is to follow them. You know, if, if it snowed in the Middle East, which it rarely does, but if wherever Jesus would have been stepping, you know, basically, you're in his steps. A few years ago, Tracy and I uh, uh, went to Virginia uh, on a vacation, and we were somewhere in the hills of North Carolina, I forget exactly where, but we noticed there was one particular, how many know when you're driving the interstate, there's people you pass and they pass you, and you get to, you're, you're like friends, you know, <laughs> I can't believe that, whatever. So there was one particular, uh, there was, it was obvious that the, there was a lead car and there was a following car. One of them was pulling a trailer or a boat or something. And so it just so happens when we pull off for gas, they stop at the same place. So be careful how you treat those people, you know. <laughs> I'll never forget, what we realized is that the, the, the person in front leading was a dad and his wife, and the person behind him was a very young driver, probably driving on the interstate or taking a trip like that for the very first time. I'll never forget that scene as the dad leans into the car. He's like, hey, now remember, there are going to be hills up here, and when this happens, this happens, and you can watch the speed here. And, 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 and you can see this thing in this dad. I'm like, I know what you're talking about. I feel, I, feel, I feel that. But I never forget the last thing he said. He said, just follow me. That's, that's what being a Christian is. Just follow him. Follow him and you'll be okay. See, I think this is why we, we, we need to understand that I never stop taking steps toward Jesus. So my question for everybody here today is pretty simple. What is your next step? Now, if you have recently committed your life to, to Jesus and you've made a decision to follow Jesus... Uh, or you've made that commitment, but you've never been baptized in water, your next step is water baptism. That is what Jesus said. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And so that is your public declaration of your faith. Hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. By the way, you don't have to have your act together to be baptized in water. You just have to publicly declare in my heart, I'm following Jesus, right? And by the way, the water doesn't, has, doesn't have magical power either. It's, decision, it's a decision that you make, but that is your next step. And let me encourage you, if you haven't been baptized in water, that is your next step. In just a few moments, when we fill out those Connect cards, make sure that you circle or mark water baptism as your next step, and we'll get you the information about that. For many of us, your next step is, is Bible engagement. Again, you, you, your heart is to follow Christ, but you're not engaging with the Bible. Your life's not changing. Uh, begin to engage with the Bible. You can do that with us in 40 Days with Jesus. The next step for a lot of you is growth track. Now, growth track for us at our church is where you get connected to this local church. So that's a membership class. It's how you learn about being part of a group, being part of a team, and how to take those next steps. So at growth track, we explain all of this to you so that you can understand. And again, by the way, we're doing a one-day growth track here in a couple weeks. So in just a moment, circle that. That is your next step. And then for a lot of you, uh, your step, next step, is to join a group. Because when you join a group, it just changes you. Because you're discussing God's word with other people. And in the group, we're going to continue to encourage you to take next steps in your life as well. Now, I think it's important 
uh, to point out, too, that when Jesus called John and Andrew and James and Peter and all of his disciples, he didn't pull out his phone, his calendar. All right, now, John, uh, you're going to meet with me at 8 a.m. on Monday. Peter, we're going to require a little bit extra time. You got two hours on Wednesday. I want you to notice that Jesus invited all of them individually, but also collectively to follow him together. Can I tell you that we need each other when we follow Jesus? And the original plan is not for us to just follow individually, but to follow him together as a family of faith. I'm preaching better than you're amen. And this is why we need the church. This is why we need to be part of a group. This is why we need to take next steps. Why? It helps me to grow as I follow Jesus. And as I follow Jesus, he changes me every time I take a step. But it all begins with one simple invitation. Follow me. One more clip from The Chosen, then we'll pray. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're going to throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Jesus is inviting you. He's inviting you. Follow me. Just like he invited Matthew, who had a lot of stuff to deal with. Just like he invited Peter, who was far from perfect, he's inviting you. 2021, follow me. It's the same invitation. Come, follow me. And I think it's so awesome. In the book of Matthew, when he calls Peter, he says, follow me and I will make you now, we focus on the fishers of men, but we forget the phrase, I will make you. I will transform you. You aren't yet, but you will be. 
Some of you are like, Pastor, I've tried. Pastor, uh, you know, I'm not qualified. Can I tell you, you began before, you can begin again. And maybe your version of Christianity is you're trying to be a good person. That's never going to work. It's never going to work. It's about surrender. It's about following. It's about learning and growing in Jesus and trusting him to change me from the inside out. It's about a real relationship with a real God who loves you. And can I tell you that if you don't have that relationship, today's your day to follow him. Just, you know, it's a journey. It's a lifetime journey, but it does begin with a decision. And today, you need to make a decision. Just like Peter did there on the beach. Just like Matthew did standing there in his tax collector booth. I need to follow Jesus. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you're watching online, bow your head and close your eyes and take a moment. Holy Spirit, we're asking you to speak to us. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, about our next step. Speak to us about our future. Speak to us about you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, you know what? I once followed Jesus, but I haven't been following him lately, and today I want to begin again. Or if you say, you know what, Pastor, I've never followed Jesus in the way that you're describing, and today I want to begin to follow Jesus. If that's you, I want to invite you to take your very first step, and it's a big, important step, just to make a decision. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to lead you in that first step, which will be a prayer, a confession of who Jesus is in your life. But it will not be the end. It will be the beginning of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can join me in this prayer by praying it out loud. Others around you are going to pray. If you're watching online, our hosts are going to be there praying with you as well. But if that's you, you say, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to make a decision. Would you pray this way? Would you say, dear God, today I have decided to follow Jesus. From this day forward, I want to be like you. Come into my life and change me. Because of the cross and the resurrection, I believe in your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you believe that's something to celebrate here today? Amen.